welcome everybody. Thanks for coming despite the uh, lovely conditions outside. I'm just going to do a brief introduction. I'm honored to introduce you guys today to two of the staff at the Western New York Center for Refugee Survivors of Trauma and Torture. Correct me on the name. Western New York Center for Survivors of Torture. Survivors of Torture. Um, so Pam Caffey is the center's program director. She works tirelessly to bring the center into existence and continues to use her skills and connections to expand the center's coordinated network of care for refugees, asylees, and other immigrant survivors of trauma and torture. She has extensive experience working for refugees and with other marginalized populations, and is a consultant as well for cultural competency, organizational, and partnership development. Ali Kadum, right? Yes. Um, works as a care coordinator at the center. He is an alumnus of our very own MSW program here at UB, as well as from the University of Baghdad. Ali serves as the chair of Buffalo's Iraqi American Society and founded BIREC, which is Buffalo's Immigrant and Refugee Empowerment Coalition, which, among other things, helps to organize the annual World Refugee Day. I'm not sure if you want to put in a plug for that. Um, so without further ado, I will allow our presenters to explain their work at the center in greater detail and begin today's conversation on working with survivors of torture. Thank you guys for attending. I'm sure we're going to learn a lot today. And please remember to sign in and fill out the feedback forms before you head out. And enjoy. Stephanie, can I just ask you to make mention of Kim, who's not able to join us? You want me to do Kim's yeah, intro? Yeah, I do. Ooh, yeah, I'm going to do Kim's yeah. intro. She was supposed to be here, but couldn't come because of the weather. <laughs> All right, I got that. Okay, good. <laughs> Dr. Kim Rigwald serves as the center's medical director. Part of her work at the center is to educate other providers in how to be culturally competent and work well with interpreters. Certified by Physicians for Human Rights, she is responsible for documenting and assessing evidence of torture and trauma in refugees and asylum seekers. She also is required to provide testimony at asylum hearings. In her spare time, she is an associate professor of family medicine and psychiatry at UB. All right, take it away. Are you going to be our timekeeper? Can you give us sure. a 15 minute warning? We'll do. Yeah, okay, thanks. Um, okay. Can you all see me over here? It's a little dark, but we're good? OK. Um, so Ali and I haven't had a lot of time to prepare, so you might see a little bit of tripping over each other today. We apologize in advance. Um, we, um, we work together every day at the center and find that we have so many clients and so many issues to deal with every day that we don't have an awful lot of planning time. Um, but we, we always seem to pull it off. Um, OK. So <clears throat> we, um, we at Jewish Family Service are um, part of a large partnership. And so um, the presentation today will talk a bit about the issue of torture and trauma, um, who our population is in the community, sort of why we started, and who all of our partners are and what we're doing now, and what we hope to be doing as we move forward with, um, with additional funding and, and community support. But to start us off, I want to know, first of all, how many of you have ever worked with refugees or studied refugees? So some of you. Some of you have information. Um, I want to do a little bit of def uh, defining who our population is. Um, a refugee is somebody who has been forced to flee their community for reasons of persecution because of uh, race, religion, ethnicity, membership in a certain political organization. Um, and... Um, for the purpose of the conversation today, the refugees we're talking about are also people who've been given status and who were resettled in the United States. Sometimes in Buffalo, we talk about refugees at Vive, and those are also world refugees, in my opinion, by ethical standards. They are also displaced and have had to flee their homes, but they don't yet have sort of a legal status as a refugee in the United States. Those are people we would refer to today as asylees or asylum seekers. Okay, so somehow they got here, and now they're pursuing asylum, which by global standards is also refugee. Okay, does that make sense? Okay. Do you want to add anything? No. Okay. <laughs> Jump in anytime. Sure. Okay. Um, it's really hard to know what our what our we don't have a lot of good data in Western New York. What we really have to rely on is the Bureau of Refugee and Immigrant Affairs in Albany. They're the state agency that, that governs um, sort of state-funded programs for refugees. So they have some data about, you know, how many refugees were resettled in Buffalo and how many received employment services that were funded by the state, this type of thing. 
I don't believe they're accurate. We have a lot of secondary migrants. Those are people who come to Buffalo after they've been resettled somewhere else. Um, we also have people who become citizens and file for their family members to join them, you know, five, six, seven years later. So they're really still having the same kind of needs that somebody who was resettled might have, but they came through different avenues and they're not being counted. Um, so let's just assume that we have about 15,000 refugees in Western New York right now and that 35% of them are struggling with the consequences of extreme refugee trauma and torture. Uh, this is something that was taken off of a UN statistic. Um, it doesn't, you know, how does that apply to Western New York? It's hard, it's hard to say, but for, for today's purpose, we'll assume these numbers are true. Um, we are called the Western New York Center for Survivors of Torture, but we know that a lot of our clients are dealing with something we're calling extreme refugee trauma. We aren't requiring our clients to divulge torture per se in order to be seen in our clinic. What we're, what we're asking for them to, to tell us is what their struggle is in the United States that you know, they're not able to handle on their own. It's, more, um, it's, a, it's a broader definition of who we serve, but um, over time this might actually have to change as we pursue funding through the Office of Refugee Resettlement, which is our federal funding stream, they're very specific about providing services to torture survivors. So we have refugee trauma, um, which includes exposure to war, political violence, or torture. It can be the result of living in a region affected by bombing, shooting, or looting, as well as forced displacement to a new home due to political reasons. Um, one thing that we don't often think about is that some of our refugee clients or asylum seekers have served as soldiers. And so they're also bringing with them um, traumatic experiences from being a combatant. Um, I'm going to read to you the definition of torture by the UN just so that um, we kind of are all clear on what we're talking about. It's a bit uh, lengthy, but. Um, so Article 1.1 of the UN Convention Against Torture defines torture as any act by which severe pain or suffering, whether physical or mental, is intentionally inflicted on a person for such purposes as obtaining from him or a third party information or a confession, punishing him for an act he or a third person has committed or is suspected of having committed, or intimidating or coercing him or a third person or for any reason based on discrimination of any kind, when such pain or suffering is inflicted by or at the instigation of or with the consent or acquiescence of a public official or any other person acting in official capacity. So the, the, key, the key here really is the official capacity. Um, so the people that we're working with have been victimized by a government or a government-sanctioned entity. So it could be... Um, or, or not even government per se. It could be whoever's running the, the area. Okay, so ISIS isn't really a government, but right now they have control over certain areas of Iraq. They would be considered this official capacity entity. Does that make sense? Mm -hmm. Okay. So this is different than somebody who was a crime victim, you know, by a group, group of bandits, for example. Okay. Do you want to add anything? So Ali's going to talk a bit about, you know, sort of the journey and what some of the stressors are that people are exposed to. Okay, so hi everyone. <laughs> uh, to talk about pre-migration is... Sorry. Do you operate that for you? To go back? Okay, yeah. So this is the pre-migration when refugees or people, they they have some kind of um, problem in their country and um, it's very struggle for them to, to either to stay or to looking for a safer place. So we see, I mean, according to emotional and physical health challenges that they face, um, so uh, we see there's too many things, uh, persecution resulting in lose of economic and education status. So imagine you work so hard, you graduate, you find a job, and after a while, um, because of unsafe or the, the, when there is a war or the, there's no economy, everything will be stopped. So you, the whole society will be freezing. So there's people, they, they're looking for how to survive with, with job, with, I mean, unsafe, because there is no export and import. There is no 
food and everything will be stopped because of their some people have more control on other things. So in this situation, um, people start to, to leave the place because of this uh, habit. So breakdown of social support and family units. So when um, they, they attacked the father and they took it, the family feel uh, unsafe. Uh, probably the other part of the family will be taken by the government or by the extremist group. So the whole scenario will start to think do I need to stay in this place or looking for a safer place? So illness with poor health care. Uh, imagine, I, I remember in Iraq when the war started, um, we don't have enough hospitals to, I mean, to run. We try to talk with people, please come volunteer and do some help. Uh, try to donate blood. Uh, the doctor, I mean, there is no, they, they are working 24 hours, all these doctors, nurses. So just to make people survive in this time. So, and we don't have also the medications. So the good thing, some uh, we start to receive some uh, uh, medications from UN, from other country. But still, I mean, there is a, a crisis happening this time. On uh, imagine, I mean, with in the United States, when we see the snow happening uh, last month, or uh, I mean, see 15 people pass away. And even we have very strong government on all these equipment. So what about in a third country, there is no enough resources to, to help. So um, we expect many people there pass away uh, because of there is no enough uh, services. So exposure exposure, or, and witness to crime and violence. And this is the very terrifying things to see people killed or shoot or, I mean, kidnap the kids, so especially for parents when they hear their neighbor, I mean, somebody kidnap their kids, they don't think that this is the right place to live. So they take their kids and they run away. Um, so if you want to talk about torture, probably this is also um, related to, to uh, the issue. Sure. I, I will add also to um, some of the other stressors. Um, we have some clients from you know different kind of groups that have come through who have had who have been forced to do some pretty horrendous things themselves in order to stay alive, and so one might consider them to actually be perpetrators of crime as well. Um, you know, it wasn't uncommon for the Bosnians to have to shoot their spouses to keep their children alive, um, or you know, and and as deeply and as horrifying as it might be that you know men would be forced to rape their own wives or daughters. You know, so I just want to kind of illustrate to you the, the, the depth of the problem of, of trauma um, in the refugee population, which goes beyond, you know, sort of um, the plight of people who've had to leave because the crops, there's not been enough water, you know, when there's a drought and there's economic refugees, we're talking about something with a little bit more um, of a traumatic impact. Um, some of our clients um, have also been exposed to torture. Um, which can include lots of different things, and these are some of the more common um, aspects of torture. So blunt or penetrating trauma, um, you know, s s stab wounds, um, broken bones, um, and then broken bones that didn't reset because they didn't have access to health care, um, stab, stab wounds that got infected, you know, um, uh, burns are very common, cigarette burns um, is sort of one, and, and other very hot uh, branding happens, electric shock torture. We had a client come in a couple weeks ago, a 23-year-old, who had had electric shock to the genitalia. Um, dental torture exists. I don't think we've seen it yet. Um, asphyxiation, you know, which is, you know, believing that you're going to die. Um, sexual violence is really a big deal um, for our clients, especially the women. We have a lot of Congolese women now coming through our program who are survivors of, of rape. Um, Falanga, which is the beating of the feet, you know, kind of um, makes it very difficult to walk after that without a constant reminder of what happened to you. Um, people um, being tied in certain positions and being hung that way very painful and can cause permanent damage to your um, ligaments and your, your cartilage. And then the threat of death to self or loved one is, is uh, causes a very significant um, impact because their torturers are really good at convincing you that if you, you know, that maybe you're hearing screams in the room next to you and you believe it's your spouse, and if you don't do something, that spouse is going to be injured. And so um, 
Anyway, those are examples of some of the stressors. I hate to just like cut it off at that, but th those are the facts. And now we're going to talk about what happens when people decide to leave. Okay, so for migration, so this is the time for people to looking for where they have to run away. Um, some people, they try to find a city inside their country or a state to just to looking for a safe place or maybe just as transition, some people, some family try to go to other country. It depends on who is open the gates. So uh, I remember in Iraq, there was only Syrian country open the gate for Iraqi. Um, yeah, just maybe Syrian. The other country, we don't have a visa, but you ha it's very difficult to get a visa. So we, I mean, I remember almost two million people, they, they went there, but you have to have, I mean, have a lot of money to get a visa for in Jordan or Egypt or Turkey so or Iran so uh, so these family who, who run away to other country um, sometimes when we got hit in some places in our body there's no pain but after a while you will feel the whole pain come come to you and this is just probably the example when the people lost I mean, their family members, job, identity. I mean, the whole life is your identity that you find yourself, you accomplish something, you work so hard on, you succeed on after, uh, I mean, something happened, you find yourself starting from zero and you lost a lot of things. So here, I mean, people, they start to remember what's going on, which is, I, I sometimes I said, it's good they find a good place, they are safe. I remember when I was in Syria, but I start to remember all my pain. So I have no future, no life, I mean, no money, nothing. So so from where I have to start, which, which country? Now, there is no home, no shelter, no health, I mean, access to health. Uh, I'm far from my family, the people I love. So it, there's a lot of things, which is the moment that you have a lot of stress in your life. But the good things, I'm safe. This is the only good things. Maybe in the other country, as Tom mentioned to me, there's a Somali person, you want to talk about this story? Or? Go ahead, okay. you can tell us. So yeah. <laughs> somebody who ran away from this country, but in the, at the same time he, he was in the forest, he saw lions there, which is another transition that he is afraid. He was hit, uh, 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 hiding under the, the tree, for almost a day? She, she had to climb the tree with her babies to stay uh, safe at night while she journeyed to the refugee camp. Uh, it's so, I mean, it's so difficult on that. Even when people just run away from their country or the city, there is, um, there is extremist people around the city in the, in the gate of all these places. So, and they start to ask you about your identity and if they see you, you are part of this group or this uh, religion or this, uh, uh, I mean, city, so they take you. Um, I was survivor of this too. I mean, thank God I remember there is a helicopter on American um, uh, car come and they, they took us to the desert and when they saw it, they ran away. So I was safe to be here. <laughs> so, which is sometimes when we remember, I mean, the people, they took them and there's a lot of things we don't want to be, I mean, talking about the, the, a lot of trauma that we, we live. So, uh, in this the circumstances, I mean, sometimes it's difficult, as I mentioned, for people where they have to go with, uh, even in some country, they don't have enough resources, uh, health care, and also, we wasn't able to, to work in this country. I mean, you just have a place, but the good things, I, I was taught, speaking Persian or other language helped me to find job in Syria. I didn't live in a camp. I see many people live in a camp and it's very struggle for them and their family. So it depends on uh, the situation and if you work uh, so hard, so you will be survived with this. So did I cover I something? So. <laughs> I think so. Okay. So the post-migration here in Buffalo, so when the refugees arrive in Buffalo, this is the struggle that they have. You know, Ali, let me take one step back. Okay. Um, I don't know if you're familiar with the process of how somebody gets the right to come to the U.S. I'm just going to take a minute to talk about that. 
So a refugee has to present themselves to the United Nations High Commissioner of Refugees somewhere in the world and show that they're out of their country because they have fled for those reasons we talked about earlier, and they have to prove their identity and their persecution. If they're lucky enough to be approved by the UNHCR, then they can decide if they want to be resettled in another country, and they have to apply. So if they apply to the U.S., you know, we only take in 70,000 a year of the millions who are, you know, displaced and, and, and who are refugees right now. But then their trip is actually coordinated and funded through the international organization migration, and they're kind of brought around the world until they get to us. Just to, so they, there's a process for that. Yeah, on one of the questions they ask, what makes your story and your life is unique? Many people now live in Iraq. What's the difference between you and other people? So you have to give evidence. I mean, sometimes show them some pictures of your work. So to convince them, otherwise they would probably reject your, your case. And they try to take the priority cases. I mean, uh, on, I know many people, they reject. On, they stop there, and after a while they return back, which is unsafe also. Or they was in in military in some way. I mean, in my country, the government forced people to be in the military. So if you are part of the military, they thought you are part of, for example, Ba'ath Party or Nazi or whatever. I mean, uh, I mean, group. So probably these these military you will not be eligible to come to this country. So it was very difficult uh, process. I remember almost two years waiting with 10 interview. Um, you have no hope. I mean, they're going to accept you or not. So yeah. So this is the, 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 the transition when refugees arrive here. Um, language barrier, as you know, I still have accent. I have difficulties. I have a lot of idea and thinking, but I try my best to, to speak, so still I, I feel embarrassed for not giving full idea. So hopefully one day I'm able to speak just like you. <laughs> so language barrier, I know many refugees when they arrive here, so uh, it's very difficult if they don't have a, somebody as translate, uh, interpreter or somebody speak their language. So it's, it's so difficult. I, I think the most difficult things is language. So uh, on the other things, we can not say there's some uh, process. Um, they thought when they come here, they're going to sit, I mean, stay home for a while and the government pay to them. So within three months, they told them, you are out of social service, you have to, to work. So on some time in Canada, different, the system there, because we heard if you go to Europe or Canada, German, the other country, each system different, because we have some people go there. So they share the idea uh, about the life in, in, in Europe or life in Canada and life here. So when they come here, some people, they, they, they have a lot of difficulty to understand the system. This is different from what they told us or uh, they put us in this unsafe area. This is also a re-traumatizing. So sometimes, I mean, some places I know refugees, they, they call and they said, I, I, I wasn't speaking sleep all the night because of the trauma, and I see the police, uh, and I heard, I mean, there's some shooting, which is, uh, this is, uh, I mean, re-traumatizing many refugees, so they need probably more uh, cultural competency, we can say, working with the refugees to make sure that where you want to put the refugee, and we have this discussion to put them in, in a one building, hopefully one day, we have, I mean, when they come, and they will find their own, own house, because uh, before they come, the refugee, they, they find an apartment, which is a cheaper place according to their budget. But many of them, they don't feel comfortable with this place, with neighborhood. So we was thinking about, is there any way, uh, or somebody can do, like, buy a, a big building with apartment, and when all these refugees come to this apartment, and after three, four months, if they want to rent, or if they find jobs, so they can move. So this is the idea, maybe, hopefully one day will be happen. So anyway, so the poverty, uh, as you know, being in social services, something that, I mean, uh, is good, I mean, but it, as a temporary, as we know, it's temporary assistance. So uh, climate change and the weather. So, <laughs> yeah, I was remember when I come here, I mean, I put all the globes on, it was freezing, and after, I mean, one winter, 
some people may ask me why you don't have gloves. I told them, no, I'm in Buffalo, so I, I learned how to survive. So at the beginning, it, it was freezing for us, so we used to now. Um, uh, the, yeah, more culture. So with the family and integration, we can say an integrational, intergenerational, intergenerational. Yeah. kids and parents yeah. having a lot of conflict in the way that they adjust to life differently here. Sure, with, with the cultural, I mean, we see the children, as Dr. Larry mentioned, children speak language faster than parents, so we see the, the children be like a, a leader of the home more than the parents, so they they decided about their life. It was difficult, we see this culture difference, and sometimes we see in some family there is child protection service involved because of this kind of conflict. Um, so uh, also we know, I mean many women, they came from Africa or Middle East, they don't have enough of rights, so when they come here they start to discover themselves, they are abused, by husband or they don't have enough rights, so they start to have some um, uh, problem. Um, usually in, in my country or other country, there is a community support. People help each other, cousin, family, if there is a family problem. But here, the wife, should, she doesn't have, I mean, help, just 911. And if she call 911, which is aimed to a big problem for her family, and will, which is caused divorce. So, I mean, education piece is really important to educate women how to use 911 and how to use her skills to keep her family and to work with her husband. Maybe he has a lot of trauma, so to working on these uh, symptoms and work together to help each other. So, yeah, one of the meetings I remember in 2013, we have Bayrak meeting. Uh, there was almost 50 leaders from different community uh, we asked them, what is your priority needs? So they said, the struggle that we face in this country is 32 issues. We have a big uh, board on each, each community, Somali, Congolese, Libya, all these communities. So they write, it was almost 32 issues. So uh, they address it. So uh, I, I think this is only maybe, maybe the summary or some point of this uh, struggle. But I'm sure there's a lot. I hope to have this list to share it with you. So, um, this is the, I mean, after you learn English, you start to understand the system. Or some, you know, when they arrive, many refugees, they try to find their community. They feel more safe and more attached because, uh, I mean, it's, it's kind of difficult to, to be with, with, with none, in, I mean, the person who doesn't speak their language. And um, this is also, I think, is one of the problems that many refugees face. Because being with your community, will, you will not learn, I mean, the culture of this uh, society. So we, we ask, uh, I was talking, uh, I did my, in one of my classes um, uh, for, uh, in MSW, uh, does English ESL class meet their, the needs of refugees or not? So one of the things, we, we did this research, uh, with my group in the first year of uh, school. So we find that many of these classes, there's not enough culture, so they need uh, they need more, uh, I mean, cultural piece in ES, English second language, to help them uh, uh, attach with the society and understand the system. Otherwise, they will broke the, the law here, so. Okay, So I was just told we have 15 minutes for our presentation and then 15 minutes for questions. So we're going to fly now. Okay. All right. Um, so this is some general information about who's coming to the area. Um, these are the top seven nationalities we settled in 2013. Um, you can see there's an awful lot of Bhutanese. I can't really tell the color difference. Sudanese, I believe, is the 36%. 17% um, Iraqi. Um, and so on. And so in 2013, there were almost 70,000 refugees that came um, to the U.S., almost 4,000 in New York State, and then 1,300 in Erie County. We're, we're a pretty big resettlement community. If you take a look at us nationally, we have a lot of people coming. Um, so the Center um, for Survivors of Torture was designed 
to address all of these sort of critical issues that people are coming with. Um, it's, it's something that supports the resettlement process. It doesn't take the place of it. So we work very closely with the resettlement agencies who refer clients to us. <clears throat> we have seen, um, I don't have totals there. I believe it's 115. Um, so we have, and we also serve Holocaust survivors, um, just to add as an aside. Um, so we have 59 males, 45 females. The bulk of the clients are within the 30 to 50 age group at this point. We haven't been tracking children. So we, at this point, don't know how many children of survivors are, um, are in the homes of the clients we're serving. We have a lot of things that we're working on right now. But these are all the countries um, where our clients are from. We have a great amount of them from Congo and Iraq. That might be because our two staff speak French and Arabic. Um, so there's a natural sort of development and service provision taking place. Um, okay, just take a minute to digest that. Um, our center is um, what we're calling sort of a care coordination model. There are centers all over the country that have developed for a variety of different reasons from, a, from different types of organizations. Some have grown up through medical, so they're sort of a health model where the primary care physician becomes the core of the program and then they refer, and refer out to mental health and, and social work. Some are coming up out of mental health clinics, and so they're very clinical in their approach to working with the clients. Ours is really growing, through, growing up out of the resettlement world. So Jewish Family Service is one of four resettlement agencies, but uh, JFS also has a mental health clinic. So over the years, Marlene Schillinger, our executive director, has been really concerned that we don't have adequate mental health interventions for the refugee community, but we also know that mental health services aren't really the answer in most of our clients' eyes. So we're creating something that helps meld together all the systems of care that our clients are navigating with care coordinators. Okay, so every client who comes through our center is touched by our care coordinators in some capacity. Some of them are seeing our care coordinators regularly because they've got so many things they need to talk through, so many barriers, so many challenges they need to, uh, you know, have some education. I think Ali will talk a little bit more about that in a second. But we also have legal services through Journey's End. We also have forensic exams that are happening through UB Family Medicine um, that I'll describe near the end. And we have um, referrals going out to our mental health clinic at Jewish Family Service, as well as Lakeshore Behavioral Health, um, for those who are ready for mental health counseling or who are seeking that as, as an intervention. Um, our clients also have access to all of the resettlement services in the building, whether it's issues with housing or employment. Um, I'm just trying to make sure I'll leave. Okay. Um, this web is very... Um, <coughs> sort of wishful thinking on our part, and I see a couple people in here who have written in that I haven't talked to you about. <laughs> um, so this is where we hope to be, okay? We need to get future funding so that we can maintain our role after July. And we hope to see um, some of the things happening that um, aren't currently in place. So we have this big bubble in the middle of the Center for Survivors <laughs> of Torture where we do our all the project coordination, care coordination, we have mental health services, um, Journey's End um, is where our legal director sits. Up at the top where these red lines are connecting, these are all the entities involved with the forensic exams. So this is where Kim Griswold comes in. She's our medical director through UB Family Medicine. She's the one that's certified through Physicians for Human Rights. Then we have UB Medical School. We had some wonderful interns helping us in the early stages of our program. They created a human rights clinic at UB uh, Medical School and student group is now coordinating our forensic exams. They're actually on site at our center. Um, and then Physicians for Human Rights is still on board as our training partner, and they credential our physicians or mental health providers to do the forensic evaluations. And I will talk about that near the end. We're still referring out to Lakeshore Behavioral Health. We're getting pretty deeply involved with Jericho Road as they take over our local shelter. And they are really providing a lot of our um, health care um, and they don't seem to mind that our clients don't have insurance. Um, we are partnering with Catholic Family Center in Rochester as well as, well as Rochester General Hospital. We're, we're talking about how we can be a regional model. And then 
and UB School of Social Work, Institute of Trauma and Trauma-Informed Care, hopefully we'll be able to come on board when we get funding to help us doing some of our support groups, and ERI, the Immigrant and Refugee Research Institute, um, hoping we'll be able to come in as a sort of research partner for us, as well as other things, okay? So this is our big dream, so you know where we want to go. Questions at all as we move forward? Okay, so I feel like we've talked about a lot of this yeah. stuff. Okay. Um, do you want to talk a little bit about your role as a care coordinator? Yeah, so okay. let's say if there's some, we, we got referral from agency for the client. We, we have to make sure this client, um, uh, we don't know if this person, uh, what kind of help need. They said, uh, according to his report from her summit agency, uh, he has some trauma issues. So I meet with the client, I try to do assessment to, to make sure what kind of help they need. If they, for example, some <laughs> psychoeducation, we, I provide some psychoeducation uh, with them to explain exactly what's going on because of coming from many of these countries, they thought that the ghost is a part of the body, is that spiritual things, it's more than mental illness or a trauma, or why my behavior is like this, why I'm angry. So we try to provide some uh, education piece. Uh, if, if I recognize the person has severe trauma and they, are, they need a doctor or they need medication, we refer them either to Jewish Family Service, the mental or the Lower West Side Council, the actual behavioral health, uh, uh, or, I mean, some people, they have, uh, they are asylum seeker and they may need a, a lawyer to help them or they have an issue with the social services. As you know, the trauma uh, make people unable to function or their, their daily living. I, I know some students, they drop ESL class on social services. They cut all the service because of they are not attending ESL class. So as a part of receiving public assistance, you have to attend ESL class. So without explaining the reason, I know the family for almost two months, they don't have public assistance. I refer them to neighborhood legal service. They, they work with them and they got this service. So um, they provide after a while with assessment, with the appointment, they provide a report from a doctor that this person has severe depression and PTSD, so they understand the situation. So it's, it's an advocate for, for the client. Uh, it is, it's not, this is not the, like a mental illness clinic, uh, but is more than guide the, the survivor of trauma and torture to the right place and make sure they are able to function on their daily living. Um, so I changed the screen. Okay. okay, sure. Yeah. So uh, one of the things that we try to provide uh, with my client is like a mental grounding. So people they have hundreds of thoughts in, in their brain. So we uh, and they think about what's going on. Even they sit in a class. They they go home and the worst things going home. So and we recommend them to be in the social people. A group attend ESL class, come to our place, try to go. I mean, sh window shopping. So I, I provide like a, a, a mental grounding and physical grounding to to help them. If if I have this trauma coming, I mean every second. So I try to make make sure to uh, to uh, describe things around me. Like this room is it blue? Is it blue? And there is a, a projector. Try to to make some details just to distract your thinking. Build the wall between these trauma things and the, your present, because you are in the present, not in the past. We, tr we try to give them some psychoeducation on uh, 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 like, uh, uh, some of um, relaxation technique or uh, 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 defensive me mechanism to help them deal with their stress and anxiety. So, yeah. Okay. All right. Uh, what's our time frame? It's one ten. Okay. So I think that I'm so glad Kim's not here because I would have given her five minutes. That would have been awful. <laughs> um, so the physical consequence of torture is something that our clients deal with. This is a big problem in our community, and it's really. Um, Something that we're hoping we can forge our way forward with Jericho Road to address more deeply. Um, we need to find specialists who can help us with some kind of rehabilitation services as well. You know, we have clients who have amputations, 
Um, we have we have clients who um, you know have injuries that weren't that didn't heal properly that caused them daily pain. Um, you know we're learning a lot right now about ears. You know how important they are to our hearing. If your earlobes have been have been you know lopped off with a machete, it's pretty hard to hear. Um, so um, Kim Griswold. There she is in that flowered dress there. Um, in my opinion, she's one of our local refugee health experts. She and I have been working together since the late 90s. Um, and I just think that she has an incredible amount of information. So I'm really glad that she's working on this project with us. Um, when, when, a, when an asylum seeker tries to go through the immigration system to get asylum, it's extremely difficult, especially in Western New York. I think we have a 12% success rate in Western New York, as opposed to like 60% in other parts of the country. We have really, it's our judges. I'm just, it's our judges here, our immigration judges. One of the ways to try to influence outcomes more successfully is to provide a forensic evaluation. So we can provide physical uh, evaluation or mental health. And um, we're actively recruiting clinicians who would like to volunteer to do some of this work. And in the spring, we're hoping to have physicians for human rights come back and do more training so we can get more people credentialed. The um, forensic evaluation could take four hours. It's a head-to-toe assessment um, using the Istanbul Protocol Standards, which is something you guys can look up if you want. Um, this, is, this is sort of the standard that we've agreed we would like the physicians to use. Um, Kim's in the room and several medical students are in the room scribing so that there's no way to lose information and it helps the physician remain, remain engaged with the patient. Um, okay, so, um, la, 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 let's see. One of the things that happens is the, the physician will complete their forensic evaluation and they will write it up and send it to Physicians for Human Rights to look it over. So there's, a, there's an evaluation of our evaluation. So by the time it gets back to the lawyer and to the immigration court, it's gone through several layers of experts. Um, and this is a service that we're really glad that we're able to provide. Um, and it would be the same thing for the mental health assessment. Um, so an LCSW, I think a CSW, there's a, there's a sort of a series of different credentials that would qualify someone to do a forensic. Um, an LMHC works, um, a psychiatrist, a psychologist. Um, so they would do more of, a, of an evaluation to substantiate the claims of trauma. Is there, is there a way to validate based on this person's emotional condition that this torture did occur in the absence of physical scarring? Um, The care coordinators have become a pretty important part of this forensic evaluation. I think um, in, in the beginning, just to, you know, just lessons learned, students were helping facilitate the forensic evaluations, but you can imagine the triggers that are happening during the forensic evaluation, and it's extremely difficult for our clients afterwards. So our care coordinators are very much more involved now in preparing people to go into the process, being available outside the room if they're needed, and then also being the one to transition them home. That's a question about yeah. this just put the sure. Um, so is the success rate better with the forensic evaluation or are you finding a twelve percent success rate even with the forensic evaluation? Well the problem is that it takes years for an asylum case to get through the system. So okay. the, the ones that we're doing evaluations on now we won't necessarily know about for a while. Wow. Yeah, so I guess I'd have to take a look at what Physicians for Human Rights is seeing in other communities over the, over the years. That's a really good question. That would be great to include in this. Thanks for the question. Um, let's see, I don't think there's anything new here. Um, legal services are obviously very important. It's one of the it's one of the best ways to safety is to get your status and get benefits. So we're really um, mindful of evaluating people for that service. And a lot of our referrals are coming through legal uh, services. And how about UB Law School? I mean, there are, are there any? We have started working with UB Law School. They have a, a law clinic. Right. Um, and we hope to deepen that relationship because if there are students involved in, in providing legal services to torture survivors, I'm sure there's a really strong need for technical assistance mm -hmm. and care coordination would be really helpful. Yeah. 
Um, just sort of as an aside, we're developing um, an employment service for refugees with disabilities at Jewish Family Service, and that's turning out to be a really nice service that ties in with the program, uh, the torture program. Um, we also have a parenting program that's developing um, that our clients can tap into. We have challenges. Funding expires in July. That's a big one. Um, we have issues with language and cultural barrier. You know, we, you see all those languages that were listed before all those countries of origin, and we only have Arabic, Spanish, and Italian on staff, and limited funding for interpreters. So we're looking at creative ways to, to make sure we don't have a language barrier with our clients. And we need to train more care coordinators. There's, there's a really um, high need, and we want to keep our cases, our caseloads low, because this is pretty intensive work. Self-care is really critical for our care coordinators because all day long they're hearing about torture. The forensic evaluation can take its toll on a provider because it's so intense, but it's one in a, you know, every once in a while. The care coordinators on a daily basis are exposed. So we want to keep their caseloads very low. Um, do you want to add anything? Okay. We're hoping to receive funding from the Office of Refugee Resettlement and the United Nations. They both have torture specific funding. Um, and there's all our contact info. I'll leave that on the board, and we can take questions. One thing you identified as a barrier is the the, the attitude by the local immigration judges. Yes. So, how do you get to be an immigration judge, and where's the intervention on the mm -hmm. part of the public, social workers, advocates? So, where does this videotape go? <laughs> it's used. I'll, I'll tell you, it's yeah. used for uh, students um, of the school who are unable to attend today. Okay, internal. Okay. Um, so immigration judges, I believe, are, um, I think they apply, but they are appointed and they're, they're carefully selected. Federal. There's a federal, yeah, federal through Homeland Security. I believe there's a, there's a turnover occurring, which is helpful and hopeful. Um, where is the intervention? I asked that question the other day, you know, what is our advocacy role? How do we influence change at a systemic level? You know, so that's where my that's where my head starts to go. I'm not sure why we haven't done that as a community. I, I think that's maybe something we'll be able to tackle once we know we have some good funding to carry us forward. My that, my concern right now is the direct client service, but I do think there's an opportunity for us to have that conversation someday. I don't know if that helps. So one thing that could be talked about in law school because I'm assuming a legal degree is involved in being an immigration judge or not necessarily? Uh, or so a social worker could apply to be an I immigration think like, judge. I think likely it's a law degree, but I don't know that it's a requirement. Okay. Okay. I think you have to come up through the system if you're not a, a lawyer. This I'm really speaking outside of my area of, of knowledge. Okay. Oh, so if I came in a little late because I had an appointment, but so if you answered this question earlier, I'll find out the, the answer from somebody else. So, um, so I'll, I'm curious about: um, do folks have a choice about where they want to go? You know, to Canada or to Europe or to the United States, and and. What do you think makes people choose, if there is a choice, coming to the United States? And I guess I'm curious as to, um, to your perspective on um, whether you were given, whether people are given accurate information. And I guess when I ask that question, you know, I'm just thinking of how we do not do a good job in this country, I think, with our social services system compared to other countries. And I think we have one of the highest poverty rates of the Western industrialized countries. So I just am curious about that. Sure. Um, some 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 people they have choice. Some people not. So they give me choice. Other people, when I talk with them, they said they told us uh, in the United States. But the choice is related. For example, when they ask me 
uh, in German, Canada, or United States. But to have to be in, in German or Canada, you have to have family because I don't think they have strong system for some agencies. So you have to have somebody help you there when you arrive, or at least friends, family. So, but in the United States, they, I mean, they know there is a lot of stomach agency and they know where they have to send uh, the people. So I told them no. So I have only a cousin in, my, in Canada, but I don't have his information. Uh, so so they, they moved my case to the United States. So I'm glad to be with you. <laughs> so even, I mean, when uh, there is a lot of good things here in the system, even when I talk with people who live with refugees in, in Europe or Canada, they said, Ali, how did you study? On, how do you work? They've been, their struggle, I mean, they, they give them very good money for social services and make people a kind of, I mean, stop with social services. Mm -hmm. But here, I love the things that after three months or two months, I find a job. Yeah. And with my job, I try to study, and I finish my school, and I got a good job. So, mm -hmm. so it, and right. when I talk with many friends, people overseas, they said, I mean, we are surprised to find people in the United States. They can study, and they can work. Yeah. And they've been in social services forever. Yeah. Yeah. They pay more than they pay here. I mean, uh, I mean the, their income. So they make people feel that I don't have to work. If I work, it's gonna be equal, the same. So why I have to work? Let me use my time. So anyway, the good things. There's some. I know there's some uh, uh, side effect of the system. We need to make sure to help with it. But I mean, I, I find it is helpful for me myself. Maybe it's not helpful for other people. Yeah. So without I, this pressure, yeah. maybe I wasn't able to finish school or to right. study or to yeah. work. Yeah. You know, for years, I, um, I've been working with refugees for a long time, and the, the system has changed a lot over the years. It used to be that there wasn't much cultural orientation overseas for people before they came. Um, and so everything they learned, they learned through the, the word of mouth. And what would happen in some cultures that people would come to the United States and find it's not like Dynasty or you know whatever it is that you see on TV, and it really is a struggle, but you don't want your family to know that, so you don't tell the truth. And your family needs money, and so you send all your money back, and so the family believes that you're really doing very well financially, and then when they arrive or another family comes and it's not like that, then they blame the resettlement agency and think you're holding their money back. And so yeah. there was a lot of money invested in doing cultural orientation overseas. Mm -hmm. So I, I don't know if that really has helped at all, but I don't think there's as many conflicts as there used to be. Yeah, sure. People might be a bit more prepared when they come. Uh, I remember there's only two uh, lecture before I come, the United Nations show us the home, which is a very beautiful home. I didn't find it when I came. <laughs> <laughs> so with, with the staff inside it, so it was a shock for me. So anyway, so I don't know from where this model, I hope there will be change from there to show them exactly. And I know many families, when they arrive here, uh, as Iraqi, not other, uh, they pay ticket to go back to Iraq. Because they said it's similar but we have family and community support there, and we don't ha have here. So, and I, I did talk with them, and some, I, I was volunteer when I arrived to help them. If you want to work, you will find another place, or uh, you, you have choice here. So we try to talk with the community. The good things in Buffalo, we have I mean, a big population from each community, which is a great thing. So if somebody needed Somali, we contact with these leaders on that they will help each other from Iraqis. So it wasn't that difficult to come to, to Buffalo to compare maybe in other cities in the United States. So yeah. we are lucky with this. Yeah. Yeah. And we have Jericho, which is wonderful. Yeah, they're yeah. amazing. Yeah. yeah. So other questions? Yeah. How long has the center been? Since June. We've only been open and running since June. We took a couple months once we got the funding to design and hire and plan, and then we started. We still have a lot of designing and planning to do as we move forward. Yeah, my other part-time job with uh, Lower West Side Consulate, so I see mainly as refugees there too as a consular. So, which has helped me also to uh, to work with with the people if they need really mental health, we refer them to some places. 
Yes. Do you provide services only to refugees who have been settled in Buffalo, or do you have people coming from other cities to, to find For you? the services? Yeah. Um, we, we haven't had anybody coming from other cities. There's a network around the country. Um, there's a couple of centers in New York City. Um, there's a cluster in the D.C. area. I think, I think now there might be 17 centers around the country. So, and we're not really experts in our field at this point. We're sort of babies and getting our feet wet. Um, so I hope they don't come. <laughs> I'd rather refer them someplace else, you know. Um, but we are starting to talk about services in Rochester and maybe having some of our staff go there and partner with um, the existing services to help enhance what they're currently doing. Yeah. Was there a question over here earlier that I didn't get to? No? Okay. Yes? What qualifications are required to be a care coordinator? Well, we're really lucky that we have very two very qualified care coordinators. We have an LMHC and an MSW. Um, that is not a requirement. Um, I think a bachelor's degree, somebody who has experience working with the refugee population, who understands kind of the, the multitude of, of, of barriers that they face to engaging in mainstream services. Um, I'm really interested in people coming into this work who are uh, former refugees themselves, who bring language and cultural competency to the position. Um, we're starting to talk about doing a, a peer mentoring program where we would hire refugees and teach them case management skills so that they can get involved and co-serve with the care coordinators. Anything else? Yes? I, I wanted to ask about the peer mentoring program. Is there any like compensation for that? I'm assuming there's not funding at this point. But yeah, it's not part of our currently funded model, but it's something that we're hoping to get funded down the road. And we're working with Jim Sutton at, you know, uh, what is it, Rochester General Hospital. He has a, a pretty well-respected program that he's developed. He has a whole training program um, for these peer mentors. So we would probably replicate what he's already doing. Yeah. Yes? I wonder if you could explain if there is any opportunities for the MSW students who yes. are interested in this, this population could volunteer or help you mm -hmm. um, in terms of your program. Yes. Um, I think we wouldn't be where we are today if it weren't for the volunteers and interns that we've already had engaged with us. I mean, the example is that last summer we had two medical students with us. Um, now, they were able to come through a fellowship with UB Family Medicine. Just They were able to get a stipend through their program. But they, they were full-time, um, and they helped us develop all of our protocols and all of our structure. And then they stayed on as volunteers throughout their second year of medical school. So they come in every Monday. And they actually work with me to review all of our intakes, assess them for assignment, um, follow up with the referring person to triage them, and um, they're, they're very deeply involved with the work that we do. Um, we have other volunteers who are coming in to do PR and marketing, volunteers who are coming in to do care coordination services. So we're really interested in anybody who's interested in spending time with us, learning with us, um, to come on over. We don't have a, a, an ability to do a structured um, MSW internship at this point, but I believe there's some conversations starting around that. But um, just on a personal level, if anybody wants to come over, um, if there's motivation and interest in some time, we'd love to have you. Did that answer your question? Um, since self-care is such a big thing at the school and you have our lovely plaque mounted, you know, yes. how to how to do self-care. Um, could you talk about you being in this for decades, you being a fairly recent graduate and in it for, you know, a year or two, about your self-care or your dealing with trauma and vicarious trauma? I'm going to start. I'll turn on you. Yeah. I didn't do a very good job at self-care when I was doing direct service. Uh -huh. I don't do direct service anymore. So I learned from that. Um, that was your self care. That, yeah, well, you know, when, and, and so I would now, fortunately, I get a chance to influence now program development and help people coming up through the resettlement ranks. So it's very important to me that people turn off their cell phones at the end of the day, not work through weekends. I tell everybody we're not crisis responders. There will always be an emergency. It can't be ours. You know, at this point, that's not what we're here to do. Um, and we've, we've uh, developed a relationship with a clinician in Virginia. She's with the, um, 
the Virginia, and it's, the, it's called the Multicultural Human Services, and um, she is available every week for Ali and Anna to do um, clinical supervision. So, we might talk about that. Yeah. yeah. So, I think the doctor, I, not I learned from UB, which is a wonderful thing. Uh, when I talk even with, with uh, for supervision talk, it, it doesn't add, I mean, more information that I learned there. Even I told Sam, I told her, we don't want to waste this money, I will talk with her monthly instead of weekly. Yeah. So because the same information, I have it and I practice it, actually. So, which is, I mean, sometimes if I have, I mean, a case which is so difficult, I said, let me talk with her. I think I, I use the, the information that I learned here in school. It is very helpful to make sure, I mean, I, I, I take care for myself, my kids, my family. So, um, yeah, it's, it's not easy, especially, I mean, hearing what's going on for these people um, is not something easy. But we try our best to help them. So I have to say I've been very impressed with Ali's ability to take care of himself with all of his multiple responsibilities, even gardening at midnight in the <laughs> summer. <laughs> Finding time. You find yeah. time. Yeah. Sure. You know the good things? Oh, sorry. No, go ahead. Yeah. One of the things that helped me a lot is being with the community. Um, this is a kind of healing process. When we, with, I mean, when I help the community, I feel more comfortable on... It's a kind of healing from what's going on in the past. And I feel that I'm in my society. I don't feel, I mean, guilty that I left people who die every day. So especially if you have some humanitarian things inside yourself and you just run away and you left people behind you, just imagine in the war and you left your friends, family killed and you are survived. So it's a part of helping me a lot to do something for community here. Um, and I think this is a, a big, I mean, I mean, uh, transition for me, I can't say. So, yeah. One thing I'd like to say about Ali is this summer, there, uh, there was the unfortunate um, death of a 13-year-old um, boy, a member of the Iraqi community, and the reaction and coming together of the community um, was really great. And Ali was one of the leaders who helped create these, you know, peaceful moments, these um, um, very healing spaces. And so, it, I, oh. <laughs> so you know, uh, kudos to Ali and and thanks. It's a it's an important another role you fulfill in your life. So I was just going to say, we've run out of time. Do you want to do a quick plug for World Refugee Day? Yeah, so every year I organize World Refugee Day. So uh, I'm looking for pass-through organization to handle all this money. Uh, YWCA used to be as a per organization, help us as a pass-through and with uh, all these checks on money. Uh, so um, and I would love to have a volunteer organizer, more than volunteer. The organizer help us, I know, there are some students helped me previous year to run this event. Uh, it's almost, uh, it's going to be June 20 and June 21st. So uh, I can say almost 700 people for these two days uh, to provide soccer tournament and cultural things. And it's very important for the community being together, share their success challenge, and also the moment that they are not alone. So it's really, I mean, uh, I, I mean, good for them if anyone, you know, the students, be organizer. I mean, just organizer, and after a while, probably for volunteer, uh, we would love to. So the, the organizer will be, I mean, contact for uh, the fundraiser people. I mean, in, in Buffalo, the people who, who give us money for this event, and also to uh, work on the flyer. Uh, with the committee food, and we will talk about this. But if you have this interest. Please feel free, and if you know in your mind, organization would like to be a pass it through and take care of all, all this uh, check and money, so feel free to email me, please. Yeah. And I will email uh, Sydney about the, the exact day that we, we're going to start to meet and organize. Okay. All right, thank you, Matt.